This episode is made possible by our generous patrons. To learn more, visit patreon.com forward slash ink to film. Welcome to the Ink to Film podcast, where we read the book and then see the movie. I'm Luke. And I'm James. And this week we discuss Hiroshi Sakurazaka's 2004 sci fi novel, All You Need Is Kill. So I got really strong anime vibes from this this book. I don't like the whole time I was kind of picturing it as an anime. I was reading it and like imagining anime characters saying these lines. Um, I don't I don't know what that is, but it it felt that way to me. Did you get like something similar? Tons. Uh, it that's exactly what I was gonna say. It's like it's so anime. It's so manga. It's so Japanese. Um, yeah. It feels very like shonen anime. Which and you, is but like that's that your that's your lot. shit though, right? Like you like anime a lot. Oh, I love it. Yeah, I love that kind of stuff. Okay. But it's funny. Like I read. You know, I read. I I think for me the the whole sequence of how this stuff went is I grew up reading comic books, and then watched anime, and then got into reading manga from that, and then I've read a few light novels. Um, based on certain anime that I like but I read light novels when I was a lot younger and and I I remember them fondly and I remember them being really good Uh, so it's interesting to to kind of have the experience that I have now and read something like this that's really geared towards younger boys yeah well it's interesting because it's geared towards younger boys uh, but it's also pretty explicit too so it's kind of like that maybe like young adult boy like you know like I don't know, old enough to to be, you know, throwing around the word fuck a lot. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Well, yeah, I guess I don't mean for children, but just for, I was a young. But it's definitely not like, yeah, no, it's still, I think, like like army age, honestly. It's- now, do you get like some sort of, do you get a vibe of an underlying satirical wink and a nod? There were parts where I did, yeah. Um, we should say, we're, so, you know, we're, we're going to talk about this novel um, here, and then we're going to cover the movie next week, which, uh, if you don't know, is called Edge of Tomorrow. Or also, upon DVD slash Blu-ray release, it was re- renamed Live, Die, Repeat. So if you saw it under that name, it's the same movie. Yeah, and it's had some different names throughout its um, kind of iterations, which we can talk about a little bit. But, yeah, so this this light novel is called All You Need Is Kill. And I, as far as I could tell, this was the first thing written, uh, although there is also two mangas, which I think were adapted after the fact, um, which has a lot of like illustrations and stuff. We read the light novel um, just to go back to the to the text itself, try not to be influenced too much by illustrations. Um, and yeah, I mean, I enjoyed it. Um, I guess what we're going to do is we're going to talk about it, just give our reactions to that um, so that you can kind of judge whether or not it's something you'd, you'd want to go check out or if you just want to listen to us talk about it, you know, that'll be up to you. And then, uh, yeah, and then we'll do the movie next week. Sounds good. I know it's geared towards young young boys, but it's like the extreme over-sexualization of all the female characters was like pretty, like, and I get that it was written in 04 and yeah. that it's by a Japanese author. But 04 who, wasn't like, you know, 1904. <laughs> it's 2004. No, no, no. <laughs> well, well, I just mean that like um, in 04, like you could watch an anime that would have a lot of ecchi in it yeah. and you would be like, oh, that's a normal thing to see in an anime like this. So yeah. maybe it's part of like the I culture. Still, I mean, I feel like it's still pretty common. I, I, maybe, it maybe is, not. it okay. is. Yeah, I, I've heard that described as what, fan service? Um, fan service, yeah. It felt very much like uh, there was a lot of fan service in this book, especially in the first half. I felt like it kind of petered out in the second half. Me too, um, yeah. but, I felt like it yeah. switched gears. That's why I was asking if you thought maybe there was a little bit of underlying like commentary on military stuff and and kind of like people who are involved in that and maybe like influences that they get that kind of thing and then as it moves on I feel like we get a character growth maybe from the point of view of the of the writer as well I don't know yeah I I guess um I I mean I can see that I think for me I was more tapped into and, and and this could be completely wrong but I felt like this was the sign of a writer who started out looking at these characters one way and then maybe over time writing them started to look at them in a different way. And I would argue maybe started to view these women characters as people more than just as like pairs of tits bouncing around that he was going to talk about nonstop. (laughs) I was just kind of asking you, posing the question to you. I don't necessarily think that there was any commentary really being made because it does seem fairly uh, superficial. So like kind of a, like a rough word to use, but it is very like what you see is what you get. I feel like with this. Well, and it felt, 
it also felt kind of tropey in that anime way too, right? Like I felt like I'd seen all of these characters in different animes over the years. Mm-hmm. Um, they are all very like archetypal, right? Um, you got yeah. this like small, girlish, young, uh, badass, you kind of waifish, right? And then you got like, I don't know. I mean, they're kind of like kind of gross, honestly. But like the you know the 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 big chested like cafeteria woman, right? And then uh, and then there was like the nerdy girl with the would literally had like a a wrench, you know, and like it, she was like bumping into stuff and like being all klutzy, and it was very like archetypal. Yeah, right. I do want to make a comment um, just about anime because I think anime gets a bad rap for some of this stuff sometimes yeah. because it is so stereotypically like this. But I think that that it has it has its tropes just like everything else. But there's plenty of anime for people who aren't watching a ton of anime. There's plenty of anime that break those molds and do new things. Right. So uh, I I feel like this definitely falls in the category of something that like is like you say kind of predictable and kind of similar to things you've seen before. Well, and it's also there's also a cultural divide which I think I want to be aware of. That you mm-hmm. know I'm not Japanese. I didn't grow up in that culture, and you know to me some of this stuff you know strikes me the wrong way but maybe to people who grew up in that culture it's not maybe it's like kind of fun maybe it's just more funny and, and more enjoyable and like people aren't you know kind of turned off by it i don't really know you know i i, I don't I have, i'm not really tapped into that so i'm trying not to cast too many judgments um i was able to enjoy, enjoy the novel anyway i think that it does shine in other areas i think that it is a fun read it was a quick read and there was a lot to like there. But yeah, right. I think I think his writing of his women characters is not necessarily one of the things to like, <laughs> in my opinion. <laughs> yeah, I think I, I did enjoy the book as well. I, I really enjoyed it. And I think there's something here to look at for these stories um, because it keeps coming, because it feels so similar to anime and manga. I just want to keep kind of going back to that. It's the idea that some of these tropes are there just so that you can pose a different kind of story like a different premise while also making it feel familiar and inviting and stuff so i feel like a lot of these characters being similar to other characters we've seen before but then giving the groundhog today effect to it is kind of a fun well yeah and 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 that's how kind of how archetypes can work right like that's how your like mentor character and your you know your that's how these archetypes work because we 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 do recognize them at least on a subconscious level and go oh this is kind of familiar Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, our main character is also kind of the reluctant hero that we're very familiar with as well. But, yeah, I mean, let, you touched on it, so let's, let's, let's hit it. Yeah, this premise is so cool, right? It, and, and it is kind of – I think it is kind of a wink and a nod because he knows clearly that he's borrowing from Groundhog's Day, I think. It's, it's a fun premise, and then I love the idea of taking it and putting it into a military situation because mm-hmm. it totally changes it because now the things he can learn can make him into this – unstoppable force on the battlefield and that was really mm-hmm. that really shined and, and was cool like it was unbelievable like I, I don't know I totally bought how he was able to become just so awesome at this and they did a great job of selling the idea of like most of the time when you die in combat you can't you know I mean like every time you die in combat you don't learn anything because you're dead now um, but every but he's able to learn from every death he's able to learn from every mistake that led to getting him killed and that's like the perfect way to learn how not to get killed Right. is and, and then not only that, you're also, re, you know, in a situation that's the same every time. So you can also memorize shit. So those two things combined uh, really does create like I believe that it would create this like really incredible warrior. Well, not to mention the fact that he's very like meek at first and like really not ready for combat. And then he becomes grizzled by dying all these times and seeing everyone around him murdered and killed. Yeah. And he which which I think he would have some pretty incredible PTSD. Um, but you know, he's kind of, he's kind of grits his way through it, I guess. But, um, it, it would be, I can't imagine the trauma of dying 160, you know what I mean? Like that would just be, it would be insane. Um, yeah. it, it, it's kind of amazing that he's able to function at all, uh, at the, at that point. I, I don't know. It's like, it's like, do you want to ascribe to a worldview where that would turn you into like a hardened badass or, or would it like make it so you were like afraid to do anything? I don't know. B- because you, you've been there and you know how bad it can be. He also is incredibly lucky, and this is something I thought about in the movie too, which I think might even get kind of lampshaded. But um, he's so lucky that all of these wounds end up being fatal (laughs) because, you know, there's so many times where things happen that, you know, could almost kill you, but instead just make you into a vegetable or something, and then you're fucked (laughs) because you have to die for the the loop to reset, uh, I believe. So, 
yeah, which we can get into like kind of the science behind it and the the concept and stuff more as we get into the nitty gritties. But I want to get your take on like where what you were expecting from this because we haven't read this before, but we've seen the movie. So what what were you expecting versus what you got? So uh, having seen the movie, I was expecting the movie. I didn't know right. how how different it would be. Yeah, and pretty different. Um, I was I was pretty surprised by the changes, and I I was expecting kind of this Tom Cruise adventure rather than being that. It brought me back to like the days of reading light novels and when I had more time to watch more anime and read more manga, and that was fun because it was almost like a little throwback for me in in this story that I wasn't expecting. It reads very differently as a Japanese story versus as this Americanized movie that we got. I think I think the movie kind of may even make it a little more broadly appealing. Yeah. I don't know. What do you think? Well, it has a dark... This, I mean, we won't spoil it, but it, it is a darker story, ultimately. And a lot of that, I, I believe, was changed from the movie. I actually don't remember the movie, like, super well, so I'd be really interested to revisit it. Um, but I there was a lot here that I was like, that's not how it goes down in the movie. So, um, and, and some of that darker stuff does put an interesting kind of uh, twist on the end that I wasn't expecting. And I found that... I. I enjoyable just because it wasn't I it was a surprise and and it was cool to see something different but yeah if you read this first I wonder how that how that darker ending really struck you like because I could also see I also felt a little bit frustrated with, with it we'll get into why so I, it sounds like we need to move on to actual plot here so we can talk about specifics but before we do that I want to go ahead and tell you a little bit about the author so Hiroshi Sakurazaka is a gamer. He has a background in IT. Um, he, he mentions that he was inspired by video games for this book specifically. I, there was a little afterward in my version where he talks about this and, and how uh, playing video games is something that, that inspired him to write this novel. Did you have that part? I, I think I did, but I didn't read it, okay. but I can totally see that. It's yeah, so he was game. basically, it's a short, so it's actually kind of cool, but he was just talking about how he's the kind of person who'll play through a game multiple times and, until he gets to the hardest difficulty and then he'll beat it on the hardest difficulty. And how he felt kind of empty by it. And like he felt like, well, of course I'm gonna beat it because I've restarted this a billion times. And mm-hmm. I've and and all of those times where I died don't matter anymore. All that matters is the time that I win. And so like the perfect run is what you end up with at the end. And so that idea of this kind of perfect run molded through multiple playthroughs and all of these kind of like meaningless deaths where you just learn things perfectly lines up with a video game and perfectly lines up with this story. So it's cool how he was able to take that and make this novel out of it. He should play more Dark Souls and lose all those souls and see how he feels about that. <laughs> Although there is still like there is still the concept of having like you learn from your every death in Dark Souls. So it actually really fits too. Yeah. You know, it just punishes you a little more, right? You you're just not like back two steps, but you have to start all the way over. But you do uh you definitely learn by your deaths. That's like the whole mechanism behind it. So it's cool definitely. how it can it, it it can it can be both Groundhog Day. It can be video games. Um, it can be lots of things. Um, and, and I don't. Know, I like that. So he made his literary de- debut back in two thousand two. I can't. Pr- I'm not going to try and pronounce it in Japanese. <laughs> the names of his his other his other works. So in two thousand four, his light novel All You Need Is Kill received high praise from other authors in Japan and has since been published in English by Viz Media, um, which we should say also this was translated by Joseph Reeder with Alexander O. Smith. So some of, uh, I want to I wanna also give the, the author a little bit of benefit of the doubt, and some of this could be introduced by translation or problems with translation. Um, I don't want to totally shit on the translator either, <laughs> but it's hard to know, you know what I mean? Like uh, if something's clunky or if something seems off, is that because of a translation issue or is that just because of the material? It's hard to know. Well, I would say that just the the idea of translating something from another language and making it fit completely is impossible. You can't make it fit exactly what the author wanted it to. Well, translation is really an art. Really, yeah, it is. And that's why that's why people win awards for it and stuff because it's it's tough to do. Yeah, and I mean, you would you I'm sure you can attest to this, but like the specific verbiage that you use as a writer is is so specific to the art. So for somebody to change it it's so it's so difficult. You probably won't get the same the same meaning out. But I did want to say I felt there were a lot of cliche little phrases that you would you would expect to hear um, in something like this, something that yeah. was geared towards a younger and that's audience. What, and that's what I'm talking about specifically because it's impossible to know if those, for me at least, if those phrases are present in the Japanese or if they were introduced by the translator to make it make sense for an English reader, or 
if even if they were present in the Japanese, is it a cliche in Japanese? Or is right. it more fresh? Because cliches are very language specific and very culture specific. So I gave him a little bit of leeway on that. And yes, I definitely recognized there was a lot of cliches in here that like you hear in war movies or you hear in war novels and in that kind of um, just a lot of phrasing. Um, and so I totally picked up on that. But yeah, it's 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 uh, something I was willing to give him, you know, some forgiveness for just in case it was it wasn't his fault. <laughs> Yeah. So Sakurazaka is knowledgeable about computer culture. He can program in Perl, P-E-R-L, which I don't even know what that is, but it sounds impressive. He is able to use specialized text editors such as Meadow and can typeset in T-E-X. So for those of there the, the, who know about computers, you might know what that means. I don't know a lot about it, but it sounds like he's legit and he knows his computer shit. <laughs> but yeah, that's, that's all I got on him. He's a pretty young guy. He's born in 1970, so only 15 years older than me. Uh, which is definitely impressive. This novel came out in 2004, which is the year I graduated high school. Before we go any further, how do you pronounce the main character's name? You're a little better with these pronunciations than I am, so I want to get your take on it. So the way I said, I was in my head, I was just saying Kaiji, and then the last name was Kiria, kind of close to like Korea, but like K-I-R-I-Y-A. Yeah. Well, Korea. later we later we get an implication that it, maybe it sounds something like Cage, although that also might be a mispronunciation, so it's hard to know. Kaiji, Kaiji. KG could be maybe it's KG could be KG yeah KG anyway so his, okay so let's I'm gonna give you a little summary here I think what we're gonna do is we're gonna break it into quarters I'm gonna give you a summary of this first quarter and then we can kind of react to the beginning and, and what happens in it sounds good all right so the story is told from the perspective of KG Kiraya or however you pronounce it if, if I really butcher this I might end up calling him K we'll see how it goes uh, a new recruit in the United Defense Force Despite equipping its soldiers with powered exoskeletons called jackets, the UDF is losing its fight against the mysterious mimics, extraterrestrials, which have laid siege to Earth. Kaiji is seemingly killed on the first sortie after killing an unusual-looking mimic, but through some inexplicable phenomenon, he wakes and finds that he has returned to the day before the battle. As this process continues, he finds himself caught in a time loop, as his death and resurrection repeat time and again. Kaiji's skill... As a soldier grows, as he passes through each time loop in a desperate attempt to change his fate. So let's stop there and, and, and talk about this this whole kind of beginning and, and and what your initial thoughts are on on this on this book here. He's more of a soldier than in the movie. I thought, yeah, I couldn't remember if he if he was like, because is he a journalist or something in the movie or something, something? like or like a PR guy or some okay. sort of marketing or something. We'll, we'll, we'll re revisit that when we talk about the movie. Yeah, and so this was a change right off the bat, I guess. Just the idea that he was more of a grunt who had been brought in. He was very young. But he was very green. He was very new. Exactly. Yeah. And he's just going to be there, basically. And as we find out, basically, just there's fodder. The mission that they're going on is kind of a fool's errand. And, and it, it was very um, reminiscent of a lot of other army trope kind of movies where you get very brash guys who cursed a ton and are very sexist and... Um, his, you know, quote unquote friends, although Yanabaru, I think his name is, whether or not he's actually a friend, I guess is debatable, but he's always there to make some off color joke and they go into battle and it's kind of clear that they don't really know what they're getting into. And then, yeah, he, uh, he basically gets fucked up and then uh, the quote unquote full metal bitch, uh, Rita, uh, it, it comes up to him wielding an axe and basically stays with him as he's dying. And then um, right as he's about to die, he is able to kill this this you know weird mimic which we talked about earlier. Yeah, I know it's it's interesting his first interaction with Rita. She's wearing all red and she's got this big battle axe and and I don't know what was your first impressions with her. Well, first off, I don't remember if this is in the movie or not, but the battle axe immediately screams like anime to me. Yeah, like the the idea. That well, because the, the movie it's like a big like cloud from Final Fantasy VII sword, so that screamed anime more than than a battle axe did. <laughs> That's true. Yeah, I forgot. I forgot that she had a weapon like that. Let's talk about the Full Metal Bitch thing because I don't yeah. know that it works as well as I think that it could have. Yeah, and I'm wondering if that's a translation thing. And, and it's interesting because the Full Metal, I immediately just think of Full Metal Alchemist, which this is 2004, so I'm assuming that was out at the time, right? I think so, yeah. I think the manga was still coming out actively. Maybe it's just like a more common phrase in Japanese, you know, full metal. Because to us, it's very full metal alchemist specific, but maybe it's not that in Japanese. I don't know. Maybe it has has like parallels or some sort of connection to full metal jacket or something like that. Like full metal, because that's something that we hear. 
Yeah, that's, and that's a movie that could have oh, been okay. culturally significant over there. And then also Full Metal kind of just has like a cool, cool ring to it. And then they're very into mech and, and you know, that kind of exosuit thing. Ed's arm and stuff is kind of mech-ish in, in Full Metal Alchemist. So Yeah. Well, the, she's the Full Metal bitch. So <laughs> yeah. it seems like, yeah, This I don't is know. where I think that it could work better. Yeah. If, if it had been something that they just started calling her the Full Metal bitch, right? Yeah. I think so. Like it just became her nickname over time. Yeah. Well, they also say they don't call it call her it to her face. Yeah. So at least there's some ac- you know acknowledgement that like bitch isn't a very nice thing to call somebody and doesn't necessarily mean you think they're like awesome. It's also definitely like a put down too. You know, like it's like it sounds like, but I, I kind of believe it though because it's like a bunch of men who are maybe a little bit intimidated by a woman who is clearly you know a way better warrior than them. I could see them doing it, but yeah, it's a uh, it's an interesting full metal bitch. For like sure. it sounds badass, right? Like it sounds really kind cool of. and it's cool for a female character. But what what I mean is that like if she had somehow been more attached to it, like well, if it hadn't she, been you're saying that like if she had, if she adopted it herself, right? And, like said exactly. this is what this is what you call me. Yeah, like right. owned it. Yeah, that's always going to be better than something that people say behind your back. So yeah, exactly. I'm with you there. They play it up to be like this badass line throughout the book. It's like, oh, the full metal bitch, there she is, and all this stuff. And it's like, had she, had, like, I, I think if she had embraced it, like you're saying, it would have been a little cooler. Yeah. So the other thing is that I noticed there was a lot of like mentions, like there's a lot of kind of war cliches that I, that have cropped up in in that I, in stuff I've read, where there's a lot of talk about shit everywhere on the battlefield, which like. I get that and piss, yeah, piss and shit, piss and shit, piss and shit. Like he says it a lot, and it's become it's become kind of a trope in like grimdark fantasy, and people are starting to call it out. But this is back in two thousand four, so maybe it was was still kind of new because prior to grimdark and prior to this kind of wave, um, a lot of these stories were written more as like bright and shiny, right, without the kind of grit and 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 like grossness to it. And so this is an attempt, I think, to ground it more. Um, so it's it's hard to necessarily read it through the lens of time because I think in the in the, you know roughly fifteen years since this came out, you know our, our cultural tastes have shifted a little bit at least over here. Um, yeah. To, it's not to say you can't write about that stuff, but it's just that when you do, you have to be aware that it's kind of becoming a trope of like grimdark, um, and and it comes up a lot. Like he mentioned shit like ten times in the first opening chapter. Um, people are shitting themselves everywhere. There's a shit smelling. You can smell it everywhere. Like it's constant. Um, yeah. It, he also takes a shot at war novelists, saying that they write about things they've never experienced and and they get it wrong. And I thought this was really interesting because, as far as I know, he is not a veteran, and he is purely just like a video game computer guy who wrote a war novel. And so I'm wondering if that's some sort of like like when you were saying wink and a nod, that's the kind of stuff I was picking up on a little bit. Like maybe he's aware that he's writing about something that he's only experienced in video games. And so he's kind of like, in like a way, like, you know, lampshading it or something by saying that. I don't know. It's kind of meta. Maybe. Yeah. I want to give credit to some badass stuff in, okay. in this because so far we've talked about a couple of negs, a little negative stuff here. Sure, sure. Or seemingly. But um, the exoskeletons, like it's very mech thing that we've seen the in jackets. anime plenty of times. But yeah, the jackets. I yep. love the idea that that it was brought up that it has to compensate for the for the the person inside. Yeah. In the same way that the human body is making sure that it's sending signals to your brain to punch powerfully, but also punch soft at the same time, as to not like rip your muscles and break yeah, your bones. Break your stuff. bones. Yeah. So I think that's cool that the exoskeleton's doing the same thing, and that there's a way to just as there's a way to overcome it in your body by shouting or, or like pushing adrenaline, uh, you can kind of overcome it and end up hurting yourself by punching or whatever. Yeah. Uh, the suit, you can kind of train up. There's like a the safety suit. mechanism built into it that, that he later yeah. turns off. The mimics. Let's talk about the mimics. Yes, let's talk about the mimics. Because I think this is a really cool enemy and cool design. And I think that in the in the movie, they don't really get into it like they do in the book. And I don't Oh, yeah, we get a lot more explanation in the book. Yeah. And I, I like the idea of it being like this organic thing that's because i think it was more machine like right yeah i don't know i mean it was kind of a mix of both if my memory serves in the movie yeah they're cool they're they're kind of described as like bloated frog like things and also Mm -hmm. kind of starfishy so i was having trouble kind of picturing them so that's that's one thing i will say I, i think um my having seen the movie made me be able to picture these mimics but 
just reading the novel, I was a little bit lost as to what they looked like. Um, I wonder if mm-hmm. you read it in manga form, it's probably different because you can see the illustrations, obviously. Mm. So um, I think I plan on it as well. I think I, I want to go ch- at least check out some of the illustrations. I would love to like, flip through it, yeah, and see yeah. some of them for sure. So yeah, so when he after he dies, he wakes up and he thinks that everything that just happened was a dream. And this is interesting to me because at first I, w- I kind of rebelled against it. I was like, no, no way. No way you go through all that and then you think it was all a dream. But later when kind of the mechanism of how this works, as far as I understand it, being that it's a kind of like a signal with information that gets kind of put onto your brain. Like it's like, um, th- you know, with these some sort of pulse or something that travels through time. And so in that sense, like the information of what just happened would kind of be like almost a memory or maybe kind of like a dream. So I, I retro, retroactively, I feel like I bought this first thing more. But originally, I was like, did he really just think he just dreamed that after like? Because it, it was like, how did you know what I mean? Like, there's a difference it's between so visceral, real life and yeah. a dream, right? Like, it's so visceral. Yeah, you just the pain you went through and everything. Like, I kind of, I don't know. How did that strike you? I, I think I'm with you. I, I, there was a, there were periods where I was like, kind of, I kind of felt like some of this. I don't know. I guess the sci-fi element of it was on shaky ground for me. Like you were saying, like some things weren't, weren't really fully adding up but then were explained later yeah which i'm fine with the idea i i was kind of confused as to if rita and korea were were both transporting back at the same time or if she had finished and he was now the and you know what i mean the antenna yeah that stuff was like a little murky for me i was trying to understand what happens if they're both uh, if they're both jumping back like looping at the same time yeah i guess i got the impression that she, all of her looping was done in the, in, in the past in that different battle and that he, he was the only one looping now um was was what i gathered that's what but, i think i got by the end because they kind of explained the idea that but she was definitely like gearing up to loop like i think she her plan was to go out and kill that antenna and and become the one who loops because i think that's how she wins all these battles and then like i guess he did it first so he became the loop instead of her I think so. Because she has this whole thing where, like, 30 days before a battle, she doesn't have anybody interrupt her so that she can have this, like, quiet time that she'll revisit time and time again, obviously, um, because she's planning to get, like, into another loop. That's that's kind of what I think. A lot of this isn't explained directly. It's more like you have to kind of piece it together from the information you're getting. Um, but, yeah, we are getting a little ahead. Uh, they also throw out another nickname for her that I feel like works probably the least for me. And that's Mad Wargarita, which I guess is supposed to be like a margarita. I don't know. Did you, what, did you remember that one? I, I honestly don't. I, I It's pretty funny, but I, I don't know. It's and maybe that it's one, a like, they called it her or... face. Yeah, it could be. Mad Wargarita. I liked, I liked the nod to like the Valkyrie thing. I thought the Valkyrie yeah. was a cool nickname for her. Valkyrie. She has a lot of nicknames, which is cool, you know, for someone like her. I can see that. Um, so then we also learned about ISO push-ups, which is kind of a yoga-like thing where you're holding a pose for a really long time, and it's to it's to make your muscles used to like situ- like positions you might have to hold in a inside the jacket, I guess. So it was interesting. It was I like the way it was explained. I said I said that the description of of Rita, at least from my perspective, as you know, a Western reader, um, felt a little sexist. It felt like a, a he the, he had to describe her in a way that wasn't a threat to him. Like she had to be small, she had to be cute, she had to be like kind of dainty when she wasn't in her. And and he talks a lot about how he expected her to be this big brutish, and he even has this whole thing where he talks about like ugly gorillas that are like the women that usually fight and and stuff like that. And that's well, what he, he had he like three from categories. Her. He had like three categories yeah. for women. That was rough for sure. But yeah. I think that I the the small um, dainty girl thing might also have something to do with like the Japanese audience. Sure. Sure. Cause that's, that's like a yeah. very, that's definitely a trope. Yeah. But, but also I think it's, it, there, it's kind of like a male ego thing. I, I, I think I'm safe in saying, cause he, he, it was, he's, she's not intimidating outside of the suit. So therefore she is like an object of attraction rather than like, if she had been this kind of like tall Amazon, maybe still beautiful, but like, you know what I mean? Like powerful kind of what we get more in the movie. Um, you know, would this version of our main character have been attracted to her or would, or, or have liked her as much or would he have been more intimidated or I don't know. Yeah. It, it felt like um, it just felt a little odd to me. I guess it's OK. She's also very young. I don't know. 18, 19, I guess. I think by the time by this by this time, she's like 21. But when she first enlists, she's like 16. OK. 
Yeah, I don't know. It's interesting. Um, like you said, there's some cultural things there that maybe maybe are just aren't translating well. So I'll give it the benefit of the doubt. But yeah, the 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 categories there are like there are things when he was talking about like categories of women. There are only three categories of women, and like there's like the gorillas. There's like the ones who stay home, and then I forget what the third category was. But because the whole time I was just like, oh fuck this, <laughs> like um, it was pretty bad. So there was a few things that were that were that uh, like I I feel comfortable saying we're definitely a little off-putting. Oh, also, he does have to give us an update on, you know, he lets us know what her breast size is, um, which is something that becomes a bit of a recurring uh, segment. I, I was I was noticing, like, when are we going to get the old tit update? And then here it would come. Like, let me let me tell you how the tits are right now, just so you can <laughs> picture it. Um, <laughs> and I look, I, I get that like a young a young boy is thinking about that a lot, but like it's very like it's it's really brutal. Yeah, it's so like every and, single and, time and, it's and like it, it's like this is what she looks like, this is her color hair, and this is what her tits look like. <laughs> yeah, um, and 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 so I want to bring up this bring, makes me bring up something because like I don't want to say that like a male character looking at a woman can't be attracted to her, can't be like checking her out because obviously that happens, right? And that happens in real world, and it can happen in our fiction. Um, it just there's a certain point where it kind of crosses over a line for me, and the line being in a work of art, in a work of fiction, the writer starts to say with big, in, in my opinion, like a big sign that says, this book is for this kind of person. And if you're not this kind of person, this book is not for you. And to me, that's very unwelcoming. And I would never, I would hope that I would never write something that feels that way. Because I don't want to write something that says, hey, you, if you don't like what I'm talking about right now, then you need to stop. You need to put this book down because this book isn't for you. And I feel like it starts to get to a point where it where it feels that way to me. It's a very big signal that says this book isn't for girls. This is a this is a book for boys, you know, and it's specifically hetero boys who are going to be excited about this stuff. I don't know. It, it just it's just something that I think is unfortunate, and I think you can really limit you can really limit your work if you if you decide I'm going to write it for this one very narrow set of audience and nobody else. But yeah, that's my uh, soapbox moment. I mean, I, I definitely see that. It, it uh, I'm not going to say that there wouldn't be some people who would still be into this kind of book that aren't that don't fit that category. But sure. it does feel, very much feel like it's like. This but they're is... they're reading it in spite of the fact that it's telling them this book isn't for you, right? And you're just kind of going, oh, whatever. I'm going to read it anyway. Mm-hmm. Um, and I just think it's unfortunate because like, if someone's going to read your book, like I would hope that you would have something in there for everybody. Um, well, this it, is the question. Do you do you think that something like this in a Japanese novel? Well, I guess l- let's t- not even put it in that context because you couldn't speak to them necessarily. Do you think that this helps sell the book to certain people, though? Oh, sure. And, and that's that's a kind of a separate discussion. <laughs> um, yeah. There is, I think, a marketing thing where you can say like this is going to be the our demographic that's going to read this, and that's why they call it fan service, right? Because it appeals to the demographic they're shooting for, and it makes them go and get it. And and it is, I think, almost a marketing strategy. And yeah, I think I think uh, if you, it, it, a lot of this stuff is very early in the novel, so I think it's like designed to where if someone picks it up and just reads the first chapter, you know, first couple chapters, they're gonna say like, oh, okay, I can see this kind of it's kind of hot. I'm gonna check this out. It's like it's like warfare and badassness and very macho. And then there's also like tits that get talked about. I'm in. Yeah, and like I do think there is a little element of where it's like they're trying to grab that reader. But it's unfortunate because also people could pick it up and read it and go, oh, I wonder if this book's, you know, like going to be interesting to me, you know, the, you know, whoever I am who maybe doesn't need to have tits talked about constantly. Um, and then they 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 read that and they go, oh, OK, this book isn't for me. Um, so I don't know. It's just it's I, I it, personally I like I, I think there is a place for sexuality and there's a place for this kind of stuff. And like writing can be fun. Writing can be sexy. It can talk about this kind of stuff. But you have to be careful of that line. And I think this book, to me, crosses that line to where it it starts to become clear that the author is saying this book is for a certain kind of person. But let's not harp on it anymore. I feel like I've said enough. (laughs) (laughs) And so before we get to the next thing where he really kind of commits to the battle, um, the first thing he does is he tries to escape. And he has this whole thing where he goes and he, like, collides with the cafeteria girl and scrapes his face up um, on her potato cart, which is also a very, like, anime kind of moment. (laughs) Uh, in my opinion. And uh, then he he is able to escape and he goes uh, out to this village and tries to like live there, but then the mimics attack and kill everybody. 
he ends up dying. He this old this girl and this old man die, and he feels kind of shame for the fact that he was supposed to be protecting them, and he he ran away. I did like it though because it shows that in the, he's not immediately like I'm going to be a hero. I'm going to be this awesome. He's the first thing he does is go, oh fuck, I don't want to die again. That was terrible. I'm getting out of here. Yeah, which is I think the reaction that you know Greenhorn would have to actually dying. Like facing death is one thing, but actually dying. Is like, I yeah, don't want because that I mean, it would be so painful. You wouldn't want to go through, like, you wouldn't want to go through it again. You'd, you'd probably do anything to avoid it again. Yeah. Um, but by the end of this, he does decide I'm going to learn how to kill with each new day, and that's going to lead me into my next little summary here. After several dozen loops, he realizes his fate is similar to that of Rita Vitrasky, a prominent ace who preferred to use a battle axe rather than a firearm. He uses his knowledge of the day to get close to her and her mechanic from whom he gets a copy of her massive axe. He learns to use the weapon well. The bolt gun that most troops are issued quickly runs out of ammo and jams easily. So this is kind of enters a section that's all about training, right? Like This is all him him learning to fight, learning to use the jacket better, um, all this stuff. He, he starts out with by going to his, um, his drill sergeant and learning like a lot from him. And then he kind of moves on to wanting to learn to use this melee weapon. This is also very shonen, the idea that, like, you have to train and then, like, there's going to be a montage of training or there's going to be a section where you get stronger. And, and the melee, having the melee weapon is, is definitely the way to go because, like, if you can actually kill something with a melee weapon, like they talked about repeatedly, you're never going to run out of ammo. You can kill everything. Yeah, so Shasta Rael is the, uh, is the sort of nerdy mechanic type character who he encounters. Um, we learned that there aren't very many women on camp, and she's one of them. And of course, she's this kind of like nerdy, but still super hot, but also um, kind of goofy and klutzy uh, character that he has a very kind of weird interaction with, where he's like holding something over her head and she's like jumping for it and stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, she's very chi- she's treated very childlike. Um, and just in case you were wondering, yes, we get a breast update. He lets us know exactly what the size is, is like for her, just so you know. <laughs> but yeah, I, I do I do like that the more he learns about Rita, he becomes more and more com- impressed by her. I kind of like how um, he snuck into into like the U.S. territory area yeah. of the base or whatever. And then, and oh, then... which that was kind of a surprise, too. The fact that there was like a that Rita was part of this U.S. force. Like, I guess I kind of thought everybody was just going to be Japanese in this version. But no, like Rita is American. Mm-hmm. And there's this whole American U.S. special forces who are kind of badasses. I don't know. I thought it was it was interesting to see that it was written that way. And, and I'm assuming that's not something introduced in the translation. Um I don't know. No, I think that's it. Could I guess it could have been, but to like make it more appealing to American audiences, I don't know. I doubt it. I think that there's there's always been. I mean, for a very long time, there's been this connection between the U.S. and and Japan, and I think that that's something that that um, we pop up a lot in their in their stuff, and I feel like they influence a lot of stuff that goes into our you know stories, and I think it definitely was like written like that, and and I like the idea that the U.S. um, in a way like you know how the foreign community views America, not not necessarily right now, but just the the fact that like as a military entity, we we end up in a lot of people's different conflicts or other other countries things. Um, It kind of makes sense that if Japan was being attacked, that we would be involved in some way, at least historically. It kind of lines up. Yeah, true. I like that. So, yeah. So when I was talking about how I like that he, the more he learned about Rita, the more he was impressed with her, it made me think of my experience with writing. And I think a lot of people's experience with writing. And 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 that's when you're first starting out and you read and you say, oh, this is cool. I think I, I, think I can do that. I'm going to give give it a shot. And you kind of look at a really impressive writer like a Stephen King or, you know, uh, Ursula K. Le Guin or somebody who Neil Gaiman somebody who's just like amazing and you look at them and go oh wow that's really cool I, I, but maybe if I work at it you know I'll get there and you kind of have this like greenhorn like optimism right but then once you really start trying I think the gulf between where you're at and where these like masters are you start to really recognize the more you learn you more start to like understand all the things that are going into what they do And you start to go, oh, shit. And so there's kind of a moment. There's like this medium moment where you're learning enough to be intimidated. And then you kind of have to get past that and start to, like, build your own skills in a lot of these areas and start to go, okay, now I'm I'm back on track and I can kind of feel like I I can see how they do it and maybe I can keep working, keep working. At least that's how my experience has been. 
Um, but yeah, I think there's a moment there where a lot of people give up when they first kind of set their toes in the water and they, and they learn enough, just enough to see how hard it is. And then a lot of people give up at that moment. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I, I, I thought there was some interesting parallels and I think that's true with learning to do anything, right. Versus like someone who's a master, you kind of have to know a little bit about the thing they do to appreciate what they're doing. Mm-hmm. And the, to speak to that, it, they make it look easy, right? So you're like, yeah. oh, look, that looks, that's great. That can't be too hard. And then. Yeah. And, and Rita is the Stephen King of killing mimics. So. <laughs> 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 so there's also uh, we got to talk about this cafeteria this first cafeteria scene where there's a Biff like character who comes up and keeps bullying Kay in the cafeteria and I'm just going to call him Kay now <laughs> and and I thought this was very reminiscent of like a million other kind of bullying in the cafeteria high school type situations we've seen um, Rita's there and she's kind of like keeping to her keeping to herself and she kind of watches the the, the fight on, on you know go down he is able to avoid most of this guy's punches in a very like, I don't know, cool like almost matrixy way. He can he can predict what's going to happen to like really really down to like the, you know, like smallest motions. There's all these opportunities he could have killed him. You know what actually made me think of the fight in Sam Raimi's Spider Man. No, so that's what it made me think of. Yeah, you're right. No, no, I, it made me think of the fight in the Sherlock with uh, Robert Downey Jr. Yeah, Guy Ritchie's. Yeah. Guy Ritchie's uh, first Sherlock movie. Remember when he's in that fight mm-hmm. and there's a lot of moments where he's calculating. like I can calculate by hitting him in the jaw and then it'll break this, snap this, and I can punch him. And, they, and I, I felt very much like that was kind of what was going through his head. Yeah. Like he was able to slow it down and analyze every, like, I could, if I do this and do that and do that, it'll lead to me smashing him and then, you know, and breaking his ribs and killing him and all this stuff. Mm-hmm. And he kept, like, not doing that because he was, like, taking pity on the guy. And eventually he does get punched, which then makes Rita leave. Which I didn't really know what to make of that, but later I think I understood what was happening. What did you make of this whole scene, this whole like confrontation with this guy that he really doesn't want to partake in, but is kind of forced to? I mean, it was it was a cool moment to see his progress, but the, really the thing to me that stood out again, where I didn't really fully get how this whole loop thing was working, was I feel like she knew something, right? Like she knew was this guy just so unimportant. Or, or did she know something? Because so I think what's happening here is she she has a suspicion in the cafeteria where she's like, hmm, maybe this guy has the you know the magic loop or whatever. Um, but then when he gets when she, when the guy finally lands the punch, I think to her that's proof that he isn't. It's like oh, okay, yeah, he wouldn't have gotten punched there if he was actually in a loop, you know. And so I think because she like she's kind of waiting it out, but then when that happens, she just kind of leaves. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and I, I assume that's what happens. Um, after that, he does get kind of doctored by the, uh, cafeteria girl who then like offers to have sex with him, or it seems like, <laughs> and then he turns her down. Um, so another kind of like, I don't know, boosts the ego, I guess. I don't know. It's a little, a little odd, but yeah. So I don't know. I mean, did you, t- what did you take away from that? Was that him not being quite as like the horn dog that he kind of seemed to be? Or, or what was that when he kind of turned her down? Well, I mean, up to this point, we've seen his, like, his, like, he's, like, intoxicated by Rita. So I think it might have something to do with that, that he's, like, sold yeah. on her even though he barely knows her. And he just doesn't. He... They're setting up They're setting up the romance, yeah. right? Yeah. I'm with you. Okay. So in the next section, we are going to get an extended bit from Rita's point of view. But before we do that, um, I wanted to tell you a little bit about a podcast called Novel Predictions. Um, this is a cool little podcast. Uh, it's got two women who are the hosts. They read the start of a novel and then um, that one of them has read before, but the other one hasn't. And then the one who has read it kind of quizzes the one who hasn't and asks them to make predictions about what they think is going to happen. And then, uh, you know, it's often very kind of wild and, 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 and crazy and, and, and a lot of fun, a lot of fun to be had. And then they come back with a follow up episode where they where they talk about what actually did happen. Um, but yeah, this this, this, this show is called Novel Predictions. We're going to run a promo for them. Um, so definitely check them out if you're interested in that sort of thing. Hi guys, I'm Kales. And I'm Allison. And we host Novel Predictions, a podcast where we laugh at ourselves and each other as one of us tries to predict the ending of a book the other has already read. Essentially, one of us is torturing the other. It's not torture, it's hilarious as we try and predict the story from some popular novels like Aragon, Fault in Our Stars, and more. We read the beginning, we talk about the story, and we try not to give away how royally the newbie reader is screwing up the plot. So join us every other week for fun, ruthless reviews of popular novels. Subscribe and follow us on social media, and we invite you to read and laugh along. As we torture each other. It's not torture, seriously. Maybe a little. Okay, it's just a little. Thanks for listening, and keep making novel predictions. 
We really need a new outro. So realizing that he is a fellow looper, Rita confides in Kay, telling him that the system of the mimics use. On death, they have the ability to send a signal into the past, allowing them to see the future and change their behavior to avoid that fate. In each group of mimics, there is a central nexus that can be that can cause the day to loop, as well as several antennae, all of which can signal to the loop to reset. Kay became trapped in the loop as a result of the contact with one such antenna. To escape as Rita once did, Kay must first kill all the antenna and the, and the Nexus. Mimics constantly adapt to cut Kay's attacks. He and Rita manage to eliminate the Nexus only to have the, la- the loop reset with Rita forgetting what has transpired. After telling Rita this, she acknowledges that they missed one antenna. On the 160th loop, they proceed to eliminate the antenna again. And so I'm going to stop there before we get to kind of the twist, right? Because I want to talk about, we get we get a lot of stuff stuff here with the POV shift. We get Rita's POV, and we get a lot of background for her, and then we get an omniscient POV. But for, first, let's talk about Rita. So I really like that we came out of our main character's POV and got her backstory. Because I feel like it adds a lot to her character. And I feel like it, it gives, where we were talking about how the author is kind of, not caring about his female characters. He really like dives in and gives her like the backstory that we wanted to know about, I feel like. And I felt like there was kind of a shift in overall tone to this book right at this halfway point when when, when this happened. It felt like um she became a lot more of a character and and um I felt like he kind of wrote her a little more sympathetically. Mm-hmm. Well, up to this point she is, she's just seen like up on this pedestal for for our main character and also for the rest of everybody else who's in the book. And this, we kind of get to know that she, you know, it's, she's reluctantly the way that she is. And I think yeah, that's a cool so wrinkle in her character. You want to you go over her, her background? Sure. Yeah. I mean, basically, from, from what I understand, she started out um, like loving animals and, and like living in a small town with her, with her father who, did he do farming or was it just a farming town? I think he was like a pig farmer or something like that. Yeah. So she was, she was very connected to animals and nature and just wanting to peacefully live her life. And I think her brother got called away to the war. Or he left and went to the academy or something. She and her dad go to this, go to this shop in town and basically get, we kind of get this idea of how her, her father felt about, about the war and how the the shopkeeper kind of wants her to carry on the shop and the dad's like no you need to carry on the farm but all that's right. being set up just so that the mimics roll through and attack like four years after that or something yeah, yeah a few years later the mimics rolled in and um we're just kind of uh it was like a scout team of mimics came through and some of the farmers shot at them triggering an attack which like completely destroyed the whole town yeah i like how it, it really shows how like fearsome these things are that like all these people with their small arms were like you really struggle and like most of them die yeah. i think it was like one in three of all the people in the town end mm-hmm. up dying don't they kill a couple of the the mimics they like, do kill, by yeah. hand it was also? like it was like by hand or something which is interesting i'm like how does that work but i guess like, i think you can just punch sheer them sheer weight i don't know <laughs> yeah, i don't know but yeah, so that kind of sets up her character for this revenge thing, and she wants to kill all of the the mimics because her whole family's gone, right? Yeah. So she enlists at sixteen, kind of illegally. She, I think, she uses like a different passport or something to changes her name, and uh, yeah, she just wants to get in there and kill mimics. Basically, you know, <laughs> she's on a revenge kick, and she's very good at That's it. That's what I was gonna say. Yeah, she's very yeah, good she, at it, she, even before the she loop. kills. Yeah, she kills like ten before the loop and gets like a medal for for being like the first person to kill ten. And so, yeah, and then she gets into the special forces unit. So she's in the special forces unit before the loop thing even starts to happen. So that's cool, too, because it's like her skill is not. She like already is a prodigy for battle. Even though she w- doesn't want to be. Like she, she would much rather be at home, you know, farming. Yeah. Yeah. Reluctant, reluctant hero. So uh, after that, so I thought that was really cool, too. Like I was like it was a really nice kind of like breath of fresh air to switch all of a sudden to her POV. I did not think we were going to get that. I liked it. And we also see her like at the end of like the section, she gets stared at by some weirdo who's doing like an exercise she's never done before. And so she decides she just wants to go check it out and like see what's going on with this guy. And so we, it kind of brings us back to that moment. Right. But then we get this another shift that goes omniscient and it's telling the story of the alien race who sent the mimics originally um, and do you want to like lay that out for, for everybody? This one, this one is is pretty wild. So stop me if I miss anything. But basically, it's a race of people, a race of beings that need a new place to live. They need to, um, what's it called when you kind of 
change the terrain. terraform terraform yeah they need to terraform a planet so that they can they can live on it and it's it's even if you travel at the speed of light i think it's like 40 40 light years away um mm-hmm. or to earth so they they can't afford to wait 80 light years for a reply back if they did try to reach out to communicate even if earth could communicate so they don't back. know they don't know if anybody's alive on our planet or not right. they just kind of spot this planet that's in the what i probably would call the goldilocks zone that's what we refer to it now mm-hmm. and that it's like a habitable planet they identify earth and go ooh, that's habitable but yeah they they send these kind of probes in advance of the fact that they're they're coming too. like mm-hmm. they leave i think shortly after this but the plan is that once they arrive they will have terraformed. And so these nanobots are designed to terraform a planet and make it an environment that they will thrive on. Well, and what's interesting about it is they're adaptable. So they, they are just nanobots originally, and then they evolve into whatever they need to be. So they evolved yeah. into just like giant sluggish creatures that were just like digging up the earth and basically shitting out the toxic stuff that's toxic for humans, but the the right terrain for these these aliens yeah. to live in. So it's cool because like essentially the humans are fighting a terraforming machine mm-hmm. that is like propagating itself and using this advanced technology to efficiently wipe out anything that's on this planet. I also like how there was debate about how like there was like ethics and there was like scholars on the other planet that were like debating the ethics of doing this, but then they were overridden and it was sent anyway. Mm -hmm. Um, So it's interesting because it's like they were a society that was actually kind of similar to ours in a lot of ways, but they sent this thing that seems mindless and like very one dimension, like not one dimensional, but it has like one goal and it's very single minded Mm -hmm. on that goal of destroying everything. And so it was. It was a cool way to explain why this, why these things are the way they are. Yeah, and and they only evolved in the way that they have, which is basically to be able to kill humans, and and basically they've adapted to that because humans attacked them, because they were right. I remember them basically saying that they developed weapons or weapons, not weapon yeah. systems, but they basically were able to fight back because. The humans were seen as a, a roadblock, and they adapted. The initial, to it. the initial ones that came out of the sea got like cut down by the humans, and so they had to learn. They basically evolved. They have like a rapid evolution to learn to fight humans. Yeah. and I mean, um, we do we do we talk about the time thing yet or no? The fact that they have the time loop themselves. Yeah, that which is cool. It's like an interesting idea. Yeah, the idea that they can learn from their mistakes essentially and. Um, yeah, when one when some one thing dies, they they retch, they like before that actually happens, they learn from that mistake and it never happens. Like that's really crazy, and like you can see why these things would be so unstoppable. Just a lot of a good bit of sci-fi, and I I think it's all really well laid out. It's and it's really cool and fun. I think. So sounds like you really like it. Um, I would say that this would be this would be met with some like uh, some pushback i would think and and from most of the writers i know in that it feels like it's kind of a cheat the book has been set up as a first person pov and then you get this swap to her pov which breaks that a little bit but it's still very close to her pov and then all of a sudden to have an omniscient person like an omniscient point of view come in and just info dump on us the explanation for the aliens in information that our our narrator and none of the characters in this novel know, um, it I don't know it was, it was a very odd choice to me. Um, I just haven't seen it done, and that and I guess and, and that's what I'm saying. It was a very you know, kind of reminded me of like an old school thing to do, like they used to do this a lot more in the old days where they would have this kind of omniscient like let me tell you about these aliens. I appreciated getting that knowledge because that's not something we get in the movie. But it felt kind of like a cheat because it was like none of the characters actually learned any of this information. So I almost felt like I shouldn't know it either. Mm -hmm. And I can almost see I I understand what you're saying. Like I can see keeping it a mystery also kind of makes the creatures more mysterious. And and it's almost scarier or more intimidating to know that they're just impossible to kill. And we don't know why. You know, or the, but like if you and if you wanted to reveal this information, you could write in some way for it to happen where some character could suppose this or some, you know, could like discover some bit of code that reveals some of this or something like actually have it have a place in the story. But instead, it's kind of dropped on us. And then I also felt like the characters were operating as if they knew this later on in the novel. But I'm like, there's no way for them to know it. I think Rita's figured some stuff out. Like, as far as the loop stuff is concerned, she's figured some of that stuff out. 
Yeah, but it went beyond that a couple times. Where I th- it was it, the prose, the, the the prose itself would mention would make mention of this other people, and every time that happened, I'm like, wait a minute, whoever's POV we're in right now, which was K's POV, I think at that point, he doesn't know about those people. So how is he like? Why are we getting this little bit? And I think it was kind of like a thing where the POV was kind of swapping back into omniscient. I, I guess I found it kind of sloppy. Um, to me, I feel like it was kind of breaking its own rules that it had set down from the beginning. And I don't know if any of that is a translation issue or if that is something that's that's viewed differently in Japanese uh, literature or not. Um, but to me, it was something that kind of stood out as being kind of odd. I, ultimately, I liked getting the info, but it just... Um, I don't know. It, it like to get picky about it. I guess it felt a little off to me. Yeah. Well, now that you lay it out like that, I, I agree. It is a little wonky, but... Um... I also agree with you that it was fun to get that those details. I, I liked it. What do you think the chances are that it had something to do with just the fact that it was geared towards a younger audience? That's possible. Yeah, like just give them, give them the answer to the questions they're probably having by now. I can see that. So we also learned that it took 211 loops for her to break free of this Florida loop that she initially got in. And that by the end of it, she received this special medal for killing like 100 mimics. And then, you know, we also we also get introduced to her uh, Sky Lounge quarter officers quarters, which is like very fancy um, becomes becomes uh, important in the last little bit here. And then, yeah, there's actually a moment where she interacts with uh, Shasta. And I, was, I said I was surprised to see that this book's going to pass the, the Bech, uh, Bechdel test or Bechdel test. I'm not going to say that aloud. Uh, are you familiar with that? The Bechdel test? Yeah. Where, where women characters aren't talking about the male characters have a conversation in which they don't talk about the male character and a male character. Um, and I think we get that. Although at the end, I think they do talk a little bit about, about our, like uh, the photojournalist shows up at least. And he's a man, but we do get a little bit of a conversation between Shasta and her, which was kind of cool. <laughs> there was a kind of another funny meta moment where they were talking. And I got, I got to get your take on this. They talk about the movies that have been made about her and how in the movies she's, she's portrayed by like a tall blonde woman. And I thought that was hilarious because Edge of Tomorrow, she is literally played by a tall blonde woman. But I wouldn't say that they went. I think that the, the what they were trying to say in the book is that the girl that they, they chose was very specifically chosen because she was even more good looking, per se. Um, and there was like a different version. Well, of, you could argue that that's true for Emily Blunt. <laughs> I, yeah, I mean, I think Emily Blunt is beautiful, but I don't I don't think that they're necessarily saying like. I don't think that they're trying to make her extremely beautiful in the movie. You're saying that in in the book they were implying that she was being played by I don't know like a Scarlett Johansson type. Well, I, I don't want to name any names, but specifically just like <laughs> like I think that they were trying to say like this character looks better than the main the even the main girl that everybody's in love with, and I think yeah. I think the char- I think Emily Blunt who they chose for. I don't think that they chose her for her beauty. I think they chose her for her acting prowess. And I think like... No, I'm not saying they did, but I just thought... I, I thought it was interesting that in the book, they're talking about a moody, movie adaptation of her exploits. Right. And they describe a woman that, to me, sounded a lot like Emily Blunt, who is the person who ends up playing her in the American adaptation. Yeah. That's, that's all I'm saying. There's definitely something... It, it was there, just yeah, interesting. Like it's like he was, predict- he was predicting it almost. Yeah. Um, we do get the moment where Kay comes up to her and he basically answers this question about tea. And we learn retroactively that apparently this is a thing she says to like dying soldiers with the purpose being that if they were to come back and answer her question in a future loop, then she'll know she had said it to them as they died, therefore proving that they are caught in the loop. Yeah. And I thought that was cool. Like, and it was it's something that wasn't explained initially. It was just a weird thing for her to come up and say to him about the tea. But we learned that that was this thing that she's deliberately doing because if someone ever comes up and answers it, then she'll know that they're in the loop. And then she like breaks down crying when this happens because it's like she's been waiting for somebody else to understand what she went through. Um, and then, yeah, then, then then they form this fighting tandem. They're like go through many more loops together being badasses because now he knows how to how to tell her, you know, signal to her and then get her on his side. Um, it goes very fast, this whole section. They're, they carve their way through the battle more and more and more. And then finally, on, on, on number 159, they are able to kill the Nexus and, the, and kill all the antenna. And the loop should be over. But um, now what I wasn't clear with is if he actually died. Because he just seems to wake up after they've succeeded and the loop has restarted. Um, it wasn't clear for to me that he died 
in how that went down. What do you think? Do you think he actually died? I remember like being confused in this as well. I, I, I don't. I think that he did, but I don't think that it was clear. Like I think it was like he was he was so distracted by the fact that they knocked out the antenna, and then like something took him out, or like another one took him out, or something. I, we have to talk about this this um, confrontation in the cafeteria over the the sour uh, ume umeboshi. umeboshi, umeboshi. Yeah. Yeah. So they have this like this is right after this. He kind of resets. He 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 um, talks to her in the cafeteria and they have this showdown eating this sour fruit. And I love the way this sets up what happens later. It's this kind of like confrontation where neither of them's willing to back down. It's a, it's like a test of metal. And uh, she ends up coming out on top. There's kind of an interesting almost fade to black moment where then he wakes up in her officer's quarters and they've had some sort of intimacy that we don't, we aren't privy to. Um, did they have sex? I, I mean, I think so, yeah. Okay, but it's never said, though. No. So I find it very odd that this book almost gets bashful at this moment, right? Like, we don't, we don't see hardly any actual intimacy. We never see them kiss. We never see anything like that. And, and to me, that also felt very strongly of, like, uh, I'm going to imply it, but I don't want to get mushy. You know what I mean? Like, I don't want to get, I don't want to become, I don't want someone to read this book and think they're leaving, reading a love story. Um, so I don't know. It was interesting. It was an interesting choice to not give us any sort of actual thing. And I wonder if that's like a modesty thing that maybe is a little different. Well, I don't know. I mean, it could be that, but it's also, maybe it comes back around to the thing that you were talking about before where they're shooting for a certain audience and a certain, like a young, a younger demographic, um, although maybe fascinated by sex, doesn't necessarily want to read stuff about it. And also maybe it maybe has something to do with, like you said, modesty, like maybe it's geared. But it was also not clear to me that they do actually have sex. Like I feel like I'm almost reading between the lines there, Yeah. right? Because it, it doesn't, he doesn't actually say that. Yeah, well, I mean, they. I, I think he, it's left He just up wakes us. up in her room, right? right? Yeah, it's just so it's implied. I don't know what to make of that. It was it was a little odd to me because I was like, did they like wait? Did they or didn't they? I, I really wasn't one hundred percent sure. Yeah. Um. But I think there's a strong implication that it's happened. But it, it was really interesting how they kind of glossed it over, and then later he even says something about like he he learned more about her and like was cl- grew closer to her, and that was like the only thing we got that kind of even acknowledged what happened. But he never said like slept with or anything like that or you know what I mean. It was just like he learned more about her that night. I think that's something. enough to know like something ha- intimate happened, whether or not they had sex or whatever. Like. It's just kind of weirdly bashful for a book that's like talking about boobs all the time and is like constantly like throwing around every kind of word. You know what I mean? Yeah. And and very ribald jokes coming from Yanabashi or whatever his name is and all that stuff. Yanabaru, sorry. Yeah, I don't know. It was an interesting kind of shift maybe, when it yeah, actually well, maybe, went down. It was like, now we're going to get all bashful about it. Maybe it's also supposed to be like a, a departure from that. Maybe it's like this this intimacy is like something you don't see throughout the rest of the story because it's like more real than the other stuff. That's like kind of more superficial feeling. So they are having this moment where they're kind of bonding over coffee, which we know is important to her backstory because her father was like super into coffee. Um, she has some of the last coffee on the planet. She brews it up for him. They have, they have talk about how like if you leave it out, it's going to get moldy and you shouldn't drink it. And then uh, right then the mimics attack, which is very shocking. And it was also very shocking to me, someone who didn't know this was going to happen because it's a big twist. The mimics attack. Something's different. They've changed what they're going to do because they do a surprise attack on the base. And then they both kind of have to run out to um, take part in this fight. They have to leave their coffee un- undrank, which is so sad. I mean, I love <laughs> coffee, so I was very sad. Um and uh, they tell uh, they tell Rachel to hide in, in in her place, which is like a protected area. And then um, they run out. The photographer's been pinned by a car. Rita has to cut his leg off. And then uh, Rita and Kay are basically running around galvanizing the troops and like getting them geared up for a fight when the big shift happens. And we're going to get into this next summary here. Rita then attacks Kay once they're out of sight of allied forces. And then explains her hypothesis that being trapped in the loop has modified their brains. In essence, both of them are similar to Antenna now, meaning one of them has to die before killing the Nexus, otherwise the loop will continue indefinitely. Reluctantly, the two battle. Kay mortally wounds Rita and stays by her side as she dies. Before Rita dies, Kay confesses he's developing feelings for her before she tells him to win the war quickly and prevent anyone else from suffering their fate. He slaughters the remaining mimics and destroys the Nexus. 
Weeks later, he is hailed as a new hero of the United Defense Force, while he silently reflects on what trans- transpired and the sacrifice needed for them to win the battle. He paints his exoskeleton blue in honor of her memory. And then the book ends with him drinking the moldy coffee. Yuck. So that, that gets to the last bit of here. Let's, let's react to this big change. The the two changes, the attack on the base is crazy because it, yeah. we, I wasn't expecting that at all. Um, right. And seemingly that happened, did that happen because they were together that night? Because he was with her? Because things happen differently based on what he does the time before? So last time they killed they killed the antenna, but he was the last, like he, because he was an antenna himself, or she was. So they learned, um, that what happened was the mimics learned the, from that, right? The mimics learned that they were going to lose. And so then they changed what they did, and they decided to attack instead. I think it was kind of accidental that he happened to have this more like, you know, romantic night with her. That did. I don't think that directly led to it, in my opinion. But it's interesting that she kind of knows that. I don't know. I guess she. I guess she suspected it, and then that confirmed it to her that that was the thing, and then that 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 he was one as well. Maybe that was something she had kind of been suspecting, and then this was the proof she needed. Well, she. I think later she kind of says like, "I knew a little while ago," but like. Then she, then we, he, I think Kay kind of like re- was thinking like, oh, but she still wanted to spend that night with me, kind of like showing that yeah. like they both cared about each other. But that I think that's the most the most anime that this ever felt was when they were both in their mech suits with their big giant axes fighting each other, f- jumping all around and flying all over the place. Like that was very, very anime. Yeah, through and through. It was cool though too, right? Like that's the kind of stuff you like to see in anime. Yeah, <laughs> they go back to the cafeteria, literally fight in the cafeteria, which is where they had this confrontation over the sour fruit, um, which I thought was cool. Which, by the way, shout out to Good Mythical Morning, which had one where they uh, ate this fruit. So that's the only reason I knew about it because mm-hmm. I had seen them eat it and like react to how crazy sour it is. Apparently, it's insanely yeah. sour. Ever since I saw them them eat that, I've wanted to uh, I've wanted to try it. Okay, so you haven't tried it, but you do know about yeah. it. Anyway, uh, that's the only reason I know about it. Otherwise, I would have been completely like, what is this stuff? <laughs> um, I do kind of want to try it because I love sour stuff, but this seems like it's insanely, like, make your eyes water sour. Yeah, me too. I want to try it so bad. Yeah, so so the way the ba- battle went down and then him killing her, how did you feel about that? I mean, it made sense for the story, but I was almost I was thinking, I don't know if this is where you're going, but I, I was thinking how much cooler it would have been if he died and she, like, continued on. It seems like that's the decision you make in that moment, if you truly care about this person. And you know one of you has to die. All you have to do is lower your guard and let her win. Yeah. And then you know you end it. He's t- he set it up too because he talked about how he felt like he was kind of living on borrowed time and that he should have died and that he has died all these times and he's prepared to die. And I thought for sure they were setting it up. Um, I will say that him going this route is more unexpected. So maybe creates a little bit more of a unique ending. Um, I think he does feel very bad about it. And we're close to that character. So we know that from here on, once the book ends on, he's just suffering, knowing that that happened to him and, and like, he's going to have yeah. to live with that. Yeah. So, like, I can see maybe, like, you feel like you you want to be the bigger man and, like, and, and be the martyr. But he kind of is in this, like, battle mode where it's more about a test. And she's decided for him that the way they're going to determine who dies is who wins in this battle. And so he kind of accepts that and takes on the battle and ultimately wins. And I like the explanation it, give, it gives, too, because even though she's this prodigy, um, and I, honestly, without this expe- without the explanation, I would have called bullshit on it. But the explanation is just enough for me to buy it, and that's that he, he trained studying her, where she trained studying mimics. Now, he obviously studied mimics as well, but there was a large portion of his training which was studying how she fights. And then trying to learn from her. And so in doing that, he got a slight edge because his knowledge base is built around her fighting style. And so he was able to predict what she was going to do maybe a little better. I don't know. To me, it was just enough for me to where I could actually buy that he might win this fight. But what did you think? Did you buy that he would, he could possibly beat her? I mean, I think I think that yeah, the the part that you're talking about kind of helped me believe it. I also think maybe, and I don't I don't think I still think even after this whole conversation we've had, I still think that her winning would would have been cooler. I think that it would have been a better ending personally, just having him be the yeah. martyr, like you say. But um, maybe it had something to do with like this, like sort of like these two warriors going at it, and like the honor of whoever, like both fighting their heart out and both fighting as hard as they could, and whoever actually came out on top was the one to carry on. Like, maybe there was something there for that. It was also a little convenient 
if I if I can interject that the mimics kind of just disappear during this whole fight and don't interrupt. Cuz they're also in the middle of a big battle where there's mimics attacking the base. They fight for a long time and are completely left alone kind of inexplicably. Yeah. How about the fact that when it's all said and done like they at first they arrest him but then give him a medal even though he like they were both it was like a friendly fire thing like he killed somebody who was especially somebody who yeah. was so beloved like she was in the community. Yeah, and I wonder if, like, it didn't say this, but I wonder if there's, like, a thing where he kind of ex- maybe explained to some people about this whole time loop thing, and, like, maybe they didn't quite believe him, but there was enough proof to where that... I don't know, it was interesting that he was able to convince them and not just get thrown in prison, because he basically just killed this war hero. Um, but then he does go on to slaughter, like, hundreds of mimics after this, because he's on this, like, rampage of, like, despair, I guess. Um, he killed like half of so, them, half of their forces yeah, that were there, which is it's kind of crazy, honestly. Like <laughs> um, that he w- went on this true rampage, but it's very anime too. Like he just w- like fucking Goku'd out and just went Super Saiyan and killed it. everybody. So uh, this this you know? um also reminds me of another anime. It reminds me of Attack on Titan and the gear that they have to like to like shoot around and stuff. For some reason, this like jumpsuit thing that they have the the jacket kind of reminds me of that type of gear as well. But maybe that's just like how I was imagining these fights go down and stuff. Yeah, I could see that. Also, as kind of an off like an offhand thing, the uh, the cafeteria Rachel uh, she dies in this like off screen, um, and he's just kind of like oh, and so like to me that was also very dark. Like it added to the darkness of this ending. Um, this this other character just just died. Yeah. Um, yeah, and then we find out later. We we find out um, that he's been given this n- nickname, and somebody scrawls on his jacket, uh, "Killer Cage." And I thought that was a cool. Like, I actually, I think that's a really cool name. And the, one of the things I really like about it is I think there's a lot of double meanings here, and almost triple meanings here. Yeah. Because obviously, the thing he's wearing is kind of cage-like, and it's and it it, it itself kills people. So the jacket itself is kind of a killer cage. But he's also a killer who's been trapped in the cage of the time loops, right? So it has kind of multiple meanings. And then also it said that that's how Americans pronounce his name as Cage or mispronounce his name as Cage, which we've mispronounced it many, many ways, I think, in the course of this episode. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I thought that was really cool. And it also just sounds cool, Killer yeah. Cage, you know? I don't know. I think it should have been uh, Full Metal Dickhead. Full metal dick. <laughs> Full metal dick. Yeah. Yeah, I like that too. <laughs> Maybe that's the one people call him behind his back. Yeah. But yeah, so the very end he drinks the moldy coffee. What did you uh what did you make of that? The whole thing with she was saying, like, go ahead and drink it and when you out like whatever, you you're gonna get sick. And he was basically just it was just symbolic of the fact that he's like the loss and he's has to live with it. And like he didn't care what happens to himself anymore. He's almost suicidal by the end. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think it does all kind of line up. All right, so I think that's going to be it for the book, but uh, stick around for the end of the episode. We're going to reveal what our Halloween project is going to be, which I'm very excited about. Um, but before we do that, I want to go ahead and thank a patron, uh, Stephen E. Uh, I actually know that his birthday is coming up, so happy birthday, Steve. Um, hopefully you hear this, and yeah, thank you for being a patron. Happy birthday, Steve, and thank you for supporting us from day one, and thank you yeah. to all of our patrons. We really appreciate it, and you're helping us stay stay afloat here and keep this podcast going. Absolutely, and if you wanted to help us in another way that doesn't require any money at all, you could leave us a rating and a review on iTunes or wherever you download podcasts if you're able to do it. Um, that's a free way you can help us get the word out and, and keep this thing going. Also, if you wanted to connect with us online, we're on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, all of those at Ink to Film. We're active on there, so anything you send our way, we will see. Also, if you wanted to send us feedback for this episode or any other episode that you've listened to, you can send that to inktofilm at gmail.com. Yeah, let us know if you're excited about Edge of Tomorrow, our coverage coming up for that, anything you want us to pay attention to, that kind of stuff. Uh, we'd love to hear it. And uh, yeah, lastly, we just wanted to say thank you to Ross Bugden for the use of our intro and outro music. So yeah, our uh, our project for Halloween is something we've been looking forward to for a while now. I think we've mentioned it several times. I'm very excited about it. Well, I mean, it's something. This is a this is a big one for the podcast in general. We've been making this podcast. We knew we would cover this. Yeah, it's our it's gonna be our first time returning to our very first author, Stephen King. We even shout him out on this episode, not but not planned. But yeah, we're gonna be covering The Shining, which is one of his you know biggest works, a huge movie. Yeah, not to mention it's one of my favorite movies. That's our October project. It's going to culminate in a Halloween episode for The Shining. So definitely stick around for that. 
Um, yeah, we got one more episode before we get into that where we're going to do Edge of Tomorrow, but then, you know, then, yeah, we're going to get to our Halloween stuff. So I'm very excited for that. The fall, the leaves are starting to change. The weather's starting to turn here in Oregon, at least probably still hot as hell in Florida. <laughs> yeah, it's never not, but, <laughs> but, but I'm excited, man. And I, I'm really looking forward to that. So I, hopefully everybody sticks around. All right. Until next time. Thank you guys for listening. I'm Luke. And I'm James. See you next time. Welcome to the Ink to Film Podcast, where we read the book and then see the movie. I'm Luke. And I'm James. And this week we discuss Hiroshi Sakurazaka's 2004 sci fi novel, All You Need Is Kill. Wait, 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 wait. Doesn't this, isn't this, seems pretty familiar. Yeah, I feel like we've done this before.